Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Latam Stocks podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Flood. Today, I'm speaking with Bowtie Mara. He's one of the best Argentina-focused accounts on Twitter that posts content in English. He also has a substack where he talks about Argentinian politics, economics, lifestyle. It's one of my favorite accounts for Argentine information on Twitter. And he also runs SOV Spot, which is a, a website and consultancy that helps expats with things like residencies and, and citizenships. So I'm really eager to get some of his boots on the ground perspective about what's really going on in Argentina. So let's do it. Hi, Mara. How are you? Hi, Patrick. Yeah, doing well. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course. I'm really eager to talk to you. So before we get into the Argentina stuff, tell people a little about yourself and the Bowtie Mara account, SOV Spot. You know, where are you from originally? How'd you end up in Argentina? Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm originally from the Netherlands. I've been living in Argentina for about 20 years. I studied Spanish in, in the Netherlands and then afterwards moved to, uh, to Latin America. Uh, I've lived in Brazil also for a while in Sao Paulo. I used to be married to a Brazilian. And then, uh, you know, we she was studying here in Argentina. And uh, after her studies, um, we split up after a few years. I stayed here. I had to move all my stuff from Sao Paulo to Buenos Aires because the initial idea was that I would be living in Brazil. But, mm. you know, I ended up in Argentina and uh, ended up liking it a lot. So I just stayed here. Yeah. So what's your background then from a, a professional perspective? Were you working in Brazil when you were living there? Uh, so no, I was still doing my final research master a year and I did that all from abroad, basically. So I did that between uh, Brazil and Argentina and like moving around the whole time. So I finished that. And then afterwards, I, um, you know, kind of figured out that with my research subject, uh, which was uh, Spanish literature, I wasn't really going to find any any jobs here. <laughs> so uh, I pivoted to, uh, you know, uh, learning programming, marketing, et cetera. And I started working in a digital marketing agency here locally. And after a few years, I started my own digital agency and uh, I've been doing that ever since. So basically, yeah, I, I had to, you know, sort of reinvent uh, my career from that starting point. And uh, it did give me some really good, you know, uh, perspectives on marketing and advertising in general, just because it's more of a literature background versus, you know, purely business. Cool. So let's talk about Argentina then, because yeah. you do one of the best jobs of covering Argentina in English. I think I've commented before that it's crazy that a, an anonymous balloon animal is doing a better job covering Argentina than, than mainstream news outlets in English. <laughs> so what, you know, tell people in general, what's going on in Argentina right now? It was crazy, the news cycle when Malay got elected. You know, six months ago. So where mm -hmm. are we now? What's going on in Argentina economically? Um, so yeah, economically, I would say we're still kind of in a recession, you know, from uh, all the all the politics, uh, the economic policies that uh, the previous government basically implemented and uh, Millet uh, sort of did away, deregulated a lot of things in the economy. And we can really see that, uh, you know, the activity, economic activity has, has slowed down a lot. I think that will probably pick up uh, towards the end of the year. But yeah, it's there's been a, a really big slowdown. Inflation has uh, has come to a halt for Argentina's perspective. I mean, it's still like four or five percent month over month, so it's it's still high. But you know, nothing compared to the three hundred percent year over year that uh, that we had at the start of uh, Millet's presidency. So it looks like they finally uh, got the inflation under control. They also uh, changed a lot of uh, the monetary issuance in terms of uh, no more debt liabilities that print a bunch of pesos all the time. So they moved all the liabilities to the treasury. So I think that will impact more on, uh, on inflation going forward. And uh, it looks like uh, that part is fully under control. Now, the the part of economic activity is, is a little bit more worrying because it does seem that in order to get the inflation under control, a lot of pesos have been sucked out of the economy. And um, yeah, so local businesses are trying to adapt, uh, but a lot of businesses have to actually you know, convert their dollar savings to maintain their business. And, you know, this goes for you know, families as well. Like everything has become so much more expensive in a, such a short period of time uh, that you know people are really converting savings to uh, maintain their their lifestyle, basically. So I think it, it's safe to say that it has two x in dollar terms in the uh, you know since Millet started. 
the cost of living is 2x. Yeah, the co- yeah, 2x. Yeah. So it, is the expat arbitrage then for the people that were earning in dollars and euros and would post all the time about how amazing cheap steaks are in Buenos Aires, is that over? Um, well, I would say that's actually continued because, well, it used to be in the first three months, you know, when rents were still very high. So uh, short term rentals were still like at all time highs. That was a period when it really became disadvantageous to to stay in Buenos Aires, or at least it wasn't you know that appealing versus what it was last year. But right now, because of uh, all the short term rentals that are on the market, and there's just way too much supply, uh, prices have actually dropped again. So rents are a lot cheaper. You can find you know uh, really nice Airbnbs for twenty twenty five dollars a night uh, in Palermo. And uh, right now, the uh, since the inflation is kind of under control, you know, stakes have um, have maintained their price level in dollar terms. So I would say that right now it's competitive again, uh, but not so much for locals because you know the the prices in pesos have gone up a lot, and uh, you know, uh, the recent devaluation in the blue dollar rate makes it more appealing for you know uh, foreigners if they earn in foreign currency basically again it was stable for a while and that's that was basically the period where you know the inflation was still picking up and everything became more expensive in dollar terms and that's kind of reverting right now and i think that will that trend will continue towards the end of the year it will probably you know keep increasing uh, the blue dollar rate so dollar dollars will buy you more over time with less inflation Okay. So, you you know, it seemed like before Malay got elected, Argentina was in a place where there was going to be economic pain no matter who won, right? The Malay plan or, or the Krishner's plan. But now locals are feeling the pain. So is there still the same political support for Malay compared to when he got elected or, or have people started to turn on him and, and are losing faith in the project? So not yet. I think this is going to be a tipping point before the 2025 midterms. Uh, if the economy doesn't pick up in the next couple of months, I do think a lot of people are going to turn and they're probably going to look for, you know, Peronist alternatives. But so far, his his popularity is actually, you know, maintained kind of the same level, 55 percent, 60 percent, some polls. So it's still very positive. That doesn't happen that often. So I do think people will still have the patience, but you know, if if this continues for a lot longer, then patience is going to run out. Okay. So recently, he got through his first major bill, if I understand correctly, right? Like he finally passed an omnibus bill that was being debated for some yeah. time. So did it mm-hmm. officially pass? What was in it? What can you tell us about it? Um, so yeah, a lot of uh, very important uh, deregulation items were in that bill, and uh, it took some time. The original bill was about 400 pages long, and um, many of those items had to be scrapped. They reissued a new version, and that version did go through the Senate and Congress uh, with some um, uh, some changes. Uh, but overall, it's it's very positive. One of the you know uh, most important items, I think, is the you know semi deregulation of the uh, labor market, which was one of the biggest pain points in Argentina. I mean, I've had a local company here hired people, and it's an absolute headache in terms of you know if you ever want to fire someone, you can guarantee that you get like a telegram next day, and they're gonna sue you basically. And there's like a whole industry around that. And, um, you know, the employees always write. And uh, it's just a very annoying way. And this is also one of the reasons why nobody wants to hire an Argentina. And many are just, you know, employees off the books because uh, companies are just like, yeah, you know, they're going to sue me anyway. So why should I pay all these social benefits every month? (laughs) You know, I'll just pay it at the end when I fire them. So th- this change basically extends the trial period, which uh, used to be three months for any kind of company, and it extends it to six months. And there's also a difference for bigger companies and smaller companies. So bigger companies, it's going to be six months. And for smaller companies, it can be nine months. So that's a, that's very positive. It also takes away the urgency for an employee to start suing the company by creating a, how would you call that, like a a sort of fund uh, for when they get fired, which is basically a contribution from their salary, you know, that that they will get uh, as soon as they're fired. So they already get like more of a compensation there uh, besides the regular compensation that they would also uh, get. And that's another positive one. 
So yeah, I, I think that 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 was a big one. And you know, the difference between Brazil and Argentina, for example, because I've also done uh, some business in Brazil. And in Brazil, uh, an employer can actually check if somebody has a track record of suing companies. Yeah. So uh, that doesn't exist in Argentina. So you don't. Re- you really have these job hoppers that you know that just would stick for th- at least three months, get hired indefinitely, and then uh, you know would just start slacking at the job and and get fired, and then they would just do that whole process over and over again. So yeah, that that was like a huge issue, and you know I've had personal experience with this, and and it can really wreck your finances as a company. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you describe that because it sounds a lot like Brazil with the the labor disputes and everything, and and there's so many Brazilian companies I look at that have a a reserve account on the balance sheet for labor litigation because it's so common. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing here. It's really one of the most common uh, headaches of companies. You basically have to assume you're going to get sued and budget for it. Is yeah, how it exactly. Works. Yeah, which is which is miserable. But yeah. one of the other points that I followed fairly closely were the privatizations. And there was a big mm-hmm. debate. I think originally it was 30 or 40 companies. They were talking about privatizing. And then yeah. they were negotiating it down. And I read that maybe only two will get privatized. So what actually passed in the omnibus bill? Are they privatizing any major state companies? Um, so yeah, they uh, they were talking about Aerolíneas, the airliner, and uh, IPF, which is the oil company, which is uh, partially or majority owned by the state. Those two had to be taken out immediately and um, in the first version already. And uh, eventually, there were some bigger companies, or you know, not bigger than those two, but some big companies that did uh, are going to get privatized. So these are in the energy sector, uh, besides IPF. Uh, so there's Enarsa, Intercargo, Aisa, the water company is going to be privatized. Train companies are going to be privatized as well, which is you know a big one because there's just so many employees there uh, that you know I think that will be interesting to see what happens. And let's see what else. I think there were two other companies that they will now allow uh, private capital to uh, to be part of that. Uh, but yeah, overall, you know, it's it's not like the full list. Uh, and I do think that a company like uh, EPF, it, um, it's better to to keep that uh, state stake uh, in like, you know, sort of Petrobras in there because, you know, with the whole Baca Morta region in the south, uh, yeah. that's just like the one of the biggest oil and gas fields in South America after Venezuela. I, I just think that would be very beneficial for Argentina just to keep that public stake in that company um, in terms of revenue uh, generation. You know? And there's a plan to develop Vaca Morte on the table, right? Or there was already and they're revitalizing it. Is that going to get developed? Oh, yeah. Well, it is already uh, up and running. Like there's, uh, if you, I have a map on, on one of my posts on uh, Twitter and it's, uh, there's a lot, a lot of companies already developing uh, Vaca Morte, but there's a lot of uh, wells by international companies as well. EPF is just like a small, it's one of the bigger players there, but uh you know, there's uh, Total is there, uh, Chevron, et cetera, uh, uh, Pampa Energia. There's uh, a whole bunch of companies already extracting. Okay. And then do you think, are any of these privatizations, are they going to be listed publicly or is it going to be private equity type private firms taking the companies private? Uh, right now, there's no public listings planned as far as I know. So I think it's going to be private capital for now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you about Aerolinas, if you follow it at all, because it's a, mm-hmm. it was one of the funnier stories out of Argentina, I think, where the union was complaining when Millie came in and he said, fine, you guys can have it. And then they said, we don't want it. So what's the story behind Aerolinas? Can you give me some color? Uh, yeah. So Aerolinas is one of those uh, you know headache companies out of the state because they basically renationalized the company from Iberia. I think that was around 2011. And uh, since then, they poured in about $9 billion in deficit and all from, you know, public funds that could have been, you know, better spent somewhere else since, you know, uh, probably 90% of the Argentine population doesn't use Idolinias or doesn't even fly. But yeah, it's um, it's it's a very, you know, big deficit uh, for the state. And um, basically, Millet said when he uh, got elected, he said, well, you know, uh, if I can't privatize it, then, uh, you know, you can have it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, then of course they. But we're not going to fund anything anymore from from the from public uh, capital. 
And uh, of course, then all the union le leaders just went nuts because uh, the only way to survive in its current format is by, you know, pouring in more, you know, taxpayer money, basically. Is there like a, a prohibition on, on international airlines or are there restrictions? I mean, if Aerolinius just died, what would happen with the gates? Would would someone else be able to come in? Would Iberia be able to come back in or were that? Uh, so yeah, that, that that was one of the first things that Millet did. Uh, I think on the second day, he had this big uh, deregulation executive order. And uh, one of the things that was in there was open sky policy. So basically, before he got elected, it was very hard. And uh, Aerolinius had a monopoly on a lot of routes and nobody else could come in. And he changed that. And uh, basically now, you know, any competition can just uh, come in and, and start routes from, you know, uh, internally within Argentina as well. So, yeah, so domestically and internationally, that's all up for grabs. And yeah, the reason why uh, Idolinius got so big is basically because they fenced off the whole airspace and uh, they had yeah. like uh, preference for everything. So. Yeah, it was something I noticed when I would travel in Argentina, that if you wanted to go Mendoza to Buenos Aires, it was basically just Aerolíneas. Like the gates at Mendoza yeah. were were all Aerolíneas gates. There's no one else. Yeah, exactly. So what about tourism then? I, I didn't ask you before we talked, but has tourism picked up since Malay has been president? It seems like it's become a more popular tourist destination, at least in the last you know, five years since I've been... Yeah, I so. think I think in the last uh, yeah the last five to ten years, you know, it's it's steadily going up. I think right now there's a lot of uh, interest, but more more so from the investor space to invest maybe in uh, in you know bonds or or, uh, or stocks uh, from Argentina, uh, but also you know a lot of people that actually want to uh, go to Buenos Aires see for themselves, etc. After Malay got elected. Right now, it's still we're in winter time, so you know it's just less you know less busy. Uh, it's it's very you know chill and quiet right now in the city. But I do think as soon as you know the maybe the uh, winter holidays around July, you know mid July to mid August, that usually picks up a little bit, and then afterwards, once uh, the spring uh, kicks in, uh, you can see tourism pick up again. Has anywhere? Specifically, seen like a, a recent tourist boom. I know Buenos Aires has always been popular. You know, people go to the vineyards in in, in Mendoza. But are there any other cities yeah. like maybe in Patagonia that have have started to really grow their tourism industry? Yeah, I think Bariloche is always very popular, especially amongst Brazilians uh, in winter time for skiing, etc. Salta is very popular, and Salta is actually uh, in, it's in the north, close to uh, Bolivia. It's one of the provinces that has uh, the biggest. Um, percentage in foreign ownership uh, in terms of property. So uh, there's like a lot of Americans uh, who invested in vineyards there more than in Mendoza. So yeah, that's uh, that's another one that's that's very increasingly popular. Has less infrastructure in terms of, uh, you know, tourist accommodations, et cetera, if you compare it to Mendoza, but, you know, some very nice hotels and, uh, and great bodegas there. Like it's, uh, it's one of the provinces that I, I like the most. Because yeah, it's it's very quiet and um, you know beautiful scenery. It's a bit drier than Mendoza, so uh, you know less green. But yeah, it's I think it's kind of comparable to uh, Utah, probably in the states. Interesting. It's been on my list. I just never pulled the trigger on, on a trip, but it's definitely still. No, up I can, I can really recommend it. And then like if you if you do go like uh, you know just fly to Salta and then uh, rent a car and uh, and uh, do the Ruta 40. And go through all those like small towns, et cetera. It's it's really nice. Uh, yeah, yeah. It looked like an awesome trip. What else? What about beaches outside of Buenos Aires? One of the funny things, like people from Sao Paulo tell me, oh, but Buenos Aires they don't have any beaches, right? The Argentinians don't have any beaches. So, is there a nice beach town that that you know Buenos Aires people will will go out to on the weekends, or or is it true that the beaches aren't that great? Yeah, no, it's definitely true that the beaches aren't that great uh, okay. compared to Brazil, for sure. I mean, like uh, Brazil, Mexico have way better beaches. You know, the beaches here are kind of comparable to Northern Europe. So uh, it's a little bit colder. The water is colder. There's more wind, et cetera. But, you know, one of the most popular beach towns is Mar del Plata. Uh, it's, it's a very nice city, you know, nice beaches, but, you know, not tropical style or, you know, not anything yeah. that people would probably... Uh, have in mind when they think about Argentina and beaches, because a lot of people think, oh, yeah, you know, Buenos Aires is located at the water, so they must have great beaches. But, you know, they don't really realize that it's it's all a uh, river and, um, and you know, brown water that you can't really swim in until you get to 
probably three hours out of Buenos Aires, like down south there, uh, the Atlantic starts. And uh, there you start having like nice beach towns and, you know, some nice forests close to the beach. But, you know, it's nothing compared to to Brazil. I would say Uruguay is probably a little bit better. But yeah. then, you know, Brazil is, is really the place where also most Argentines go for beach holidays, if they want warmer water, they go to Florianópolis. Yeah, yeah, that's been my experience too. Once you start going with Montevideo, it's kind of the same thing with their beach, right? It's muddy, muddy yeah, water. Yeah, it's like Montevideo is just at the separation. Uh, so they do have like more ocean water. But yeah, Punta del Este is like, you know, the, the, the place where most of the jet set goes. If they don't want to go all the way to Brazil, they go to uh, Punta del Este in Uruguay. But yeah, no, I would say it's still colder uh, if you compare it to, you know, uh, Brazil. For sure. Yeah. Punta del Este, I think most people might be surprised that the it's expensive for a Latin American beach town. Yeah. Like, it, it's, it's not it's a cheap place expensive. to visit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Beautiful though. Yeah. But, uh, very nice. Let me bring us back to then the pace of inflation, because I think it's one of the, the reasons the story internationally was so captivating for people that don't really follow Argentina. They'd look at the inflation numbers and they'd go, no way. And then they'd learn about the peso a little bit and they'd look at the devaluation. So you mentioned that inflation is is better, right? It's under control mm -hmm. relative to Argentina's history. Yeah. But what's going on with the peso then? Because there were 12, 13 exchange rates before Millet was elected. There was a huge yeah. divergence between the black market rate and the official mm -hmm. rate which somewhat converged, if I, if I understand correctly. Well, yeah, and it, it, it is creeping up again. So it, it, I think the lowest point that it got was like 15% difference. Mm -hmm. And right now we're almost at 50% difference again. So it's kind of like uh, running away again. The uh, blue uh, rate is what they call it, the black market rate. So yeah, that's, uh, that's not going to change anytime soon as long as Millet keeps these, what they call the SEPO, which is basically the uh, foreign currency controls on the peso. So there's no free floating rate. They have a crawling peg. They are deval uh, devaluing at like 2% yeah, month over month, the official rate. But of course, the dollar demand is way higher than that. And that's why you know uh, the blue rate is starting to, uh, to run away from the, the official rate again. Uh, so yeah, my, one of my main worries, and I wrote about this in my last article, is um, basically Millet uh, committing the same error that uh, two previous presidents or um, uh, economists have, have done already. One was during the uh, military dictatorship. Uh, they had a lot of, uh, you know, what they call kind of neoliberal policies, et cetera, but they were very gradual because they didn't want to do shock therapy like Millet is doing. And they uh, implemented the crawling peg, et cetera. And at a certain point, like the same thing started happening where the exchange rate got so behind that they had to devalue uh, 30%, another 30%, another 30%. And then inflation just skyrocketed out of control around uh, 1981, more or less. Macri, more recently, one of the first things he did was uh, take off currency controls and liberate everything, but he didn't change anything in terms of uh, deregulation. So he was basically doing Kirchnerism, but with the floodgates open. So that spiraled out of control completely in 2018 when they had to run to the IMF to uh, kind of tap that, that hole. Uh, and the thing is with Millet, he is deregulating a lot faster, you know, uh, definitely compared to Macri, it's like a world of difference and also the other example from the 70s. But he is maintaining the FX restrictions that they had in the 70s with the crawling peg like that. And, you know, if this keeps going this way, then at a certain point, they're just going to have to devalue. And, uh, you know, it's going to be the same kind of yeah, inflationary spiral or, or has the potential uh, if if he doesn't take off those restrictions. I think it's better to take them off now. Uh, the thing is, like, they don't have any reserves uh, to uh, temper that. So if, uh, you know, which is very likely a lot of um, Argentines just start converting their pesos directly in the bank account to dollars, the uh, central bank is going to have an issue because they don't have those uh, dollars ready. So uh, they are looking at the IMF again to, you know, uh, get a sort of cushion for that, like $10, $15 billion. But I don't think the IMF is going to uh, gonna lend more money to Argentina, to be honest. So, yeah, it's kind of a, a, a really, 
a difficult situation because at the same time, you know, uh, if he does liberate everything in terms of FX controls, the same thing could happen. What happened to Makati? At the other end, you know, if he takes, uh, he leaves these FX controls too long, and they're talking about, you know, uh, well into 2025, the same thing could happen that what ha that happened before, which you know uh, will also uh, spiral into devaluation and then you know more inflation, et cetera. And on top of that, we have the maturities that are due in this government, which are you know completely nuts. I mean, if you look at the maturities. That Millet is facing, it's like uh, $215 billion just in his first term. And that's like 70% of GDP or something. So it's like that is unsurmountable. They're not going to be able to pay this without defaulting or, you know, kicking the can down the road again. And, you know, the previous two governments have basically, <laughs> they, they've kicked the can down the road and restructured uh, a couple of times. And now everything is due in Millet's term. So. You know, uh, that is one of the the biggest, you know, uh, sort of doom loops that it, that uh, his government is facing, which not too many people are talking about. But I don't think they're going to let him restructure again, because uh, Alberto Fernandez already restructured with the IMF and uh, private creditors. And uh, that is starting to uh, come due right now. And I think at some point they're, you know, they're just not going to restructure again and they want to see some money. So that will be very, yeah, it's going to be very interesting what will happen. Maybe they get super creative and they find a solution. But uh, that is, is one of the biggest issues that uh, Millet faces, I think. Yeah, that, that's quite the puzzle. I didn't know it was yeah. that much. I didn't realize it was 70% of GDP that's going to roll over in his first yeah. term. Is a default yeah. the worst outcome? I mean, is a, is a total reset for Argentina the worst outcome? Uh, I think, you know, that would be, it, it's definitely not positive in terms of, you know, asset prices and stuff. And, you know, it's, it's going it, to, uh, they did it before. Right. So it's not something new. And it is the country risk that you have to deal with with Argentina. I think personally that that's probably, you know, one of the, you know, the best scenarios, if they don't find a solution or they don't want to roll over the debt again, then, you know, they're going to have to default. There's no other way around it. And this uh, 20 or 215 billion doesn't even take into account the uh, 16 billion that they owe Burford Capital for uh, the whole IPF case uh, for the renationalization of that. They basically did that without shareholder consent in 2011. So um, they they have to pay a fine uh, for that, and and that is also uh, you know another sixteen billion. Now it's already more because they're not paying it, and it has interest on it, et cetera. So you know that's right. that comes on top of all this. So was part of the deregulation in terms of the number of exchange rates? Are there still cold play rates and twelve official rates, or is that condensed? No, yeah. So, so as long as the cap for buying dollars is there, uh, all these different exchange rates are going to coexist. Uh, so they are dumbing it down a little bit in terms of uh, you know official parallel uh, rates because there are some uh, some semi official rates for the stock market, et cetera, that run closer to the blue rate. But you know, as long as they have this two hundred dollar limit per person per month. And everything over that is basically has so much tax on it that you get close to the blue rate. You know, all these different uh, rates are just gonna gonna keep keep in place. I mean, they they really have to take everything off before that changes and it becomes a floating exchange rate. So I was going to ask you about the Cuevas, but I imagine mm -hmm. if there's a cap of two hundred dollars a month, they're still up and running, going strong, commonly used by Argentinians to to buy dollars at the black rate. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, even during Macri, there were still Cuevas because, uh, you know, they uh, there's a lot of uh, dollars that are just under the mattress here and uh, they use yeah. Cuevas to to exchange uh, those to pesos. So even though, you know, if Malay would take off uh, currency controls tomorrow or in the FX restrictions, they would still exist just because, you know, the uh, non-declared uh, amount of dollars is just so huge. <laughs> Was there a crackdown on the Cuevas? Am I remembering that story correctly? Or is that just something that happens from time to time where the police make a show of raiding a Cueva or two because it's technically illegal, but business as usual the next day? Is that 
I think. Yeah, that was uh, during Masa. Uh, so during the previous government, uh, Masa as Minister of Economy, they were you know cracking down on Cuevas, and you know Kirchnerism would do that every now and again just to show like, hey, we're being hard on this uh, you know blue dollar market, which is uh, illegal, etc. But yeah, Millet is not doing any of that. Like they know it exists. Uh, Caputo has mentioned the uh, the Minister of Economy. He has mentioned like you know. Uh, with the recent run of the uh, blue rate to 1,400 pesos per dollar, he was just like, yeah, well, you know, the blue market in total is like 10, 15 million uh, per day. It's like a really tiny compared to the to the official rate. So, uh, you know, they know it exists, but they don't really uh, care too much about it. But it is like a sort of finger on the pulse for where things are going to go, you know. <laughs> it's like it's a very important indicator for me. It's hard to crack down too, right? You walk down Florida in Buenos Aires and it's it's every corner. It's not even every corner. There's a couple guys on every corner, right? There's so many of them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So is it still mostly paper dollars that Argentinians are buying if there's a limit on, on bank account transfers? Or have stable coins like USDC by Circle or, or Tether, USDC, mm-hmm. have they become popular in Argentina? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it's really easy to exchange crypto for, you know, physical dollars or physical pesos uh, at a cueva. And yeah, it's it's all, you know, paper dollars or crypto uh, or stable coins, basically. So uh, those are the most uh, popular ways of, of getting dollars. And, uh, you know, a lot of physical dollars, because if you buy a house here, you know, it's usually cash dollars. Uh, that's still the main Mm-hmm. Um, way um, a payment method here. I mean, uh, unless the seller of the of the property has a U.S. bank account, then you know, in some cases they uh, they want to have it overseas. But uh, you know, in all the other ones, you just uh, show up with a suitcase full of dollars and and buy a really? property. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you would never make the transfer to the Argentinian bank, so I wouldn't do a, a swift no. transaction from U.S. bank to an Argentinian bank. I mean, you uh, you can, but just because uh, because of all the regulations, et cetera, like majority just doesn't even bother because, uh, you know, you, you have to see if it arrives and there's just so many additional headaches that people just don't want to deal with it. So you basically have to smuggle dollars into Argentina, right? Because there's always a limit. What is it? I think internationally, $10,000 without declaring it. So do people mm-hmm. that buy property yeah. in Argentina literally smuggle a suitcase of cash into the country? So you can do it like more officially where you can do it through a broker, for example. Uh, you can buy um, Argentine ADRs in, in the US and then they can sell them here, give you the dollars. But all those things have a lot of fees on them. So mm-hmm. you'll end up losing like four or 5% just to, uh, to the broker. Uh, yeah, or you do it at a Cueva, which also costs you like 2%, 3%. Uh, but yeah, those are the main ways. I would say crypto is probably the, the stable coins are probably the easiest because you avoid a lot of the, you know, other percentages that you have to pay left and right. And you just pay the the cueva. Uh, and if, you know, the, the owner accepts stable coins, that's even better because then, you know, you don't have any kind of additional fees. So how are Argentinians accessing the stable coins then? Are they using a, a local crypto exchange like Ripio? Are they sending pesos to Ripio and then buying USDC? Or do they go to a Cueva and give them cash yeah, they pesos? Go, yeah, so they go to a Cueva. They have, the P2P market on Binance is like huge in Argentina. So uh, a lot of people just meet up and you know exchange uh, that way. But yeah, Cuevas are definitely the most, the number one option. Is there a limit? Is the two hundred dollar limit apply to cryptocurrency exchanges too? I mean, can you only buy two hundred dollars a month on Ripio, or, or can you uh, buy as many stable coins as you want? No, you can buy as many stable coins as you want because the uh, the rate is is basically it follows the blue rate, so uh, it's the crypto dollar. Mm. That's what they call it, and uh, it's basically the same as as the blue rate. Okay, so you're you're taking a haircut on the exchange rate yeah. then. Exactly. Understood. That's interesting because, uh, yeah, you hear the crypto people talk a lot about how common stablecoin usage has become internationally, and Argentina is a perfect test case. So to hear that that it has actually become yeah. popular and people are using it in the day-to-day transactions is interesting. I mean, most people accept it because I was last in Argentina in 2022. So if I went and I had a, a Coinbase wallet and I wanted to pay for I don't know, dinner 
with a stable coin in Argentina? Like, what are my chances the restaurant's gonna gonna take a hundred dollars in stable coins? No, that that's like very slim. I'd say okay. I've never, yeah, I've never actually uh, done that. But there's there's some local card providers, so like Belo, uh, or you know, you can just uh, charge your uh, your credit card and and pay that way. Uh, okay, so, so you, you charge fund, your, yeah, you fund your credit card with uh, stable coins or Bitcoin or whatever, and then you pay that way. But yeah, no, I've never done a direct stable coin transaction because I also think like they're so uh, probably afraid to get scammed, et cetera, that they just mm-hmm. don't even bother. So it's just like, you know, cash or local debit credit cards and, and that's about it. Yeah, that makes sense. So what else are Argentinians buying to protect themselves from the, the peso devaluation, the inflation? I mean, dollars, obviously, but... Gold, mm-hmm. Bitcoin, real estate, are those all popular fiat currency hedges? Uh, so, yeah, gold, not so much, uh, mm-hmm. just because it's, you know, hard to prove the, uh, you know, that it's legit gold, et cetera, and you're not being scammed. But, you know, there are some people that uh, do buy coins, et cetera, but yeah, the majority is just, you know, really uh, dollars. And then uh, for younger people, stable coins. Uh, you know, of course, uh, real estate is a hedge because everything is denominated in in dollars. So uh, if you see a downturn in Argentina, you know, the real estate will more or less maintain the same pricing. Uh, I mean, it did go down a lot since the peak in 2018. I think if you take into account dollar inflation, et cetera, it's probably, you know, 50% cheaper versus uh, the peak. But, you know, if you compare that to peso destruction, which was like 95%, you know, then it's still like a pretty good edge for most Argentines. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. So that's a perfect segue then, because I want to ask you about real estate in Argentina mm-hmm. in more detail. You cover it on, on the Bowtie Mare on the Twitter account. You have one of my favorite ongoing threads that I'll ask you about in a minute. But first, mm-hmm. can you just tell me in general what what's going on with Argentina's real estate market with prices, with Anything you can tell me. We talked about the funding with the dollars a little bit, but what else? Yeah, so uh, prices are picking up again, uh, especially in the popular neighborhoods. Like it's the first, there were six consecutive uh, down years. Um, and uh, this is going to be the first year where it's like two, 3% uh, up in terms of uh, you know price action. And uh, I think that's probably going to continue because with uh, Millet, one of the big changes is that... Um, they're actually uh, instead of the banks. Uh, one thing, uh, sorry, that was my uh, my king lady. Instead of the banks uh, lending money to the central bank, basically that's not interesting anymore uh, since they uh, lowered the rates that much, and uh, they also took away a lot of those instruments uh, from the central bank and moved it to the treasury. So now banks are kind of forced to start lending again to the general public and businesses. So a lot of mortgages are coming back because. Everything you buy here was cash, uh, and it still is, you know, 90 plus percent, but mortgages are making a comeback. And um, I think that will increase prices uh, quite significantly over time if that uh, trend continues. During Macri, that was basically the last time in 2017. He started with uh, uh, very popular mortgage programs, and it it lasted about a year and a half, and then it, it kind of crashed, and uh, they didn't lend out any more uh, mortgages uh, back then. But yeah, we'll, we'll have to see how long it lasts. But I think uh, overall, you know, it's a very interesting market in terms of, you know, it's, uh, it's still relatively cheap, not compared to the rest of Latin America. I mean, you know, if you compare prices, depending on cities, et cetera, it's not the cheapest city, but it is cheap if you compare it to, you know, quality of life, uh, you know, nice city to have property returns on Short-term rentals right now are not so great just because there's just way too much supply. Like during the pandemic, everybody started shifting to Airbnb and uh, yeah. buying furniture, et cetera, and renting it out. So there's just like way too much supply. And right now, it's actually more beneficial just to do long-term rentals on some of those properties, depending on uh, what you own. So, but yeah, I'm I'm always following the uh, the whole real estate market very closely. Um, one of the more interesting things that I'm looking at now is uh, office space uh, in mm. the in the uh, microcentro, and uh, you know it's a really big disparity between the price per square meter for an office uh, versus you know uh, an apartment. 
And it's usually when it's that big, you know, that's kind of a deal to to buy, basically, <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I think that yeah. will uh, that spread will not exist for too long, probably. And, uh, you know, there's some like really prime locations for like seven hundred, nine hundred uh, dollars per square meter, which is just insane. So, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of looking at that maybe to what's a nice uh, apartment go for in, in a prime neighborhood per square meter? Uh, Three thousand. Yeah. Okay. So it's a yeah. third roughly for the, the commercial. Yeah. But if you compare the, uh, because that's in the city center. So there, you know, residential is, uh, is probably closer to 2,200, 2,500. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to the mortgages real quick. What's a typical mm -hmm. mortgage look like then now that banks are starting to lend again? Do we see the same duration? Like, is it a 30 year mortgage or do they lend for shorter terms or rates always floating? Or, or can you get a fixed uh, so yeah, rate, rate mortgage? Yeah, so rates are always floating and they kind of follow the, the dollar. So it can be very risky for Argentines. And a lot of people blew up, you know, uh, at the last time they took out mortgages. But that was also because uh, salaries were very high and sort of tanked after that. Uh, so it was very hard for them to sustain it afterwards. And right now, salaries are very low, uh, which is like kind of historically, it's been a good period to get a mortgage when that's the case. And uh, we've already seen that salaries are picking up again in dollar terms. So I think right now is if people are thinking about it, it's probably a good uh, time to uh, to think about a mortgage. And it is with a floating rate. It, it uh, follows the construction costs, which uh, are also in in dollars. So um, I have a really detailed uh, blog article about that and the way they're structured, et cetera, on uh, my website. Okay, cool. So what about the long-term rent contracts then? I think most people probably know how Airbnb works, but mm -hmm. what's a typical, you know, traditional long-term rent contract look like in Argentina? Is it a 12-month period, 24 months? How many months do you have to put down as a, a deposit? Uh, so yeah, before Millet got elected, they had this rental law in place. And uh, then and back then, nobody was renting out because there was just like a lot of downside for the, for the owners uh, because the rental contracts were minimum three years. And then they only had the option to up the rent uh, every six months, which, you know, in the inflationary scenario, scenario in Argentina just didn't make any sense. Uh, so that's also why a lot of people shifted to short-term rentals. But then uh, with the uh, executive order, uh, ba uh, he basically nuked that uh, rental law. And uh, then, uh, you know, now basically you can decide the terms. Like there's no fixed period or, you know, you can do whatever in whatever currency. It uh, doesn't matter. Usually uh, real estate agents, they will charge like a, a one month uh, deposit and then uh, one month commission. And usually the owners will also want a uh, guarantee, so uh, a guarantee that uh, you have, it's really weird, but you know, you have to have to know somebody with a uh, property in Buenos Aires and it will give you sort of like a guarantee that, okay, uh, if he doesn't pay the rent, then I'm uh, the guarantor for, for that contract. But there are also companies that sell those um, uh, garantias, so you, you can get around that, but uh, yeah, that's one of the the annoying things with uh, long-term rentals. I got around that once uh, when I first started uh, living here uh, by paying one year up front. <laughs> they were like, okay, you don't have a garantia. So we'll, you know, I, I said like, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to pay one year up front. <laughs> and then he was very happy with that, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That's an yeah. expensive way to do it, especially when the, the pace of devalues the way it does. So you exactly. cover some of the neighborhoods in Buenos Aires, the posts I like of yours. Like, like, I know that Recoleta and Palermo were, you know, the popular posh neighborhoods, but you've posted about some other neighborhoods that, I don't know, I've been to Buenos Aires a few times that I've never even heard of and wouldn't have thought to stay in. But mm -hmm. you've, you've mentioned you think there's up and coming neighborhoods that are good real estate investments. So what are the good neighborhoods now? And then where, where would you bet on in five to 10 years? What's growing? Uh, so yeah, it's basically everything around uh, Palermo is growing. So uh, Bicha Crespo is growing, uh, Chacarita, Colegiales, uh, Belgrano is is also you know great neighborhood. I think all those areas are gonna gonna grow a lot, and I think Palermo will probably uh, at some point get just as expensive as Puerto Madero. 
like Puerto Madero is still the most expensive uh, neighborhood in the whole of Latin America. It's like five to six K per square meter. Really? Uh, and I, yeah. And I think that uh, Palermo is moving that direction too. I've been checking a lot of new developments uh, and, uh, you know, basically new developments is, uh, is what most people go for just because a lot of uh, older buildings are just way too outdated, et cetera. And, um, you know, the new square, meter price in those new developments is you know uh, already around 4k uh overall so okay. um yeah i think uh why I think why is port de madera so sought after i mean i've stayed there i stayed at the hyatt one time mm-hmm. and yeah. it's a nice neighborhood but it doesn't i don't know i wouldn't pay the most expensive real estate prices in latin america to live there so what's the appeal no no me, me neither no it's uh it's really you know, it's like the nouveau riche kind of um, neighborhood uh, where a lot of people just park their money. Uh, there's a lot of empty apartments as well. It's really just more of like an investment uh, play. And uh, it is one of the safest neighborhoods in the city. Um, you know, you're close to the to the center. So, you know, you can technically walk to, to your, your work, et cetera. But yeah, I wouldn't you know, buy their evil just because I think it's it's already so high and um, it's probably, you know, it's probably going to gonna increase a little bit, but there's just, you know, the time to buy there was around uh, the two th- early 2000s. That was really the the time when you had to buy there. Okay. Yeah. So that, yeah, because that's a significant like a, premium, right? So yeah, like if, did, if Recolette and Palermo were 3000 a square meter and that's at five or six, you said? Yeah, yeah, it's double. It's double roughly. I take yeah. double the apartment in Palermo every time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Me too. Right. So, what then does like Villa Crespo and these up and coming neighborhoods relative to Palermo? Are they fifteen hundred a square meter, two thousand a square meter? What's the discount? Um, so yeah, it kind of depends. Uh, Villa Crespo is around twenty two hundred. Okay. And uh, but like Colegiales Chacarita are already around twenty nine hundred thirty two. For newer uh, apartment buildings, so it's it's getting close to Palermo pricing already. Okay, interesting. So I want to be respectful of your time, but I have to get one more question in because you have one of my favorite threads on Twitter, and you just post yeah. all these old abandoned mansions, like uh, colonial style mansions, all throughout Argentina. That I don't know how you find them all, but you post them. <laughs> some of them have real estate listings. I think some of them you Google Maps. <laughs> but yeah. Tell me about this. Like, what's it look like? Like, are you going to refurbish one of these? How much do you need to put in to to fix up your abandoned Argentinian mansion? Tell me about this. Oh yeah, no that that would be uh, that would be a dream to to do that eventually. Just you know, have enough capital just to not care about a project like that. But yeah, there's so many beautiful abandoned estancias who that you know used to belong to you know probably well-off families. Uh, got inherited or just, you know, uh, everybody died and they just are left for dead, basically. And, uh, you know, some beautiful structures, but completely abandoned. And uh, they would, you know, need significant funding to restore that uh, previous beauty. And the thing is, like, most of these things are in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, it's mm. also uh, logical why they uh, turn turn out that way, just because, you know, family members just didn't have the capital either to go there or the you know uh, uh the the they didn't want to put in the effort because it you know yeah. to keep it up it's just a lot of work and a lot of money that uh, they didn't want to put in so yeah and in some cases just like all the relatives died and and uh, you know the property is just uh, left uh, behind and this is holdovers from, I guess, what, about 100 years ago when Argentina was the fourth or fifth largest economy in the world and everybody was rich? Is that so yeah. they're all about 100 years old? Yeah, they're yeah around 100, some 150 around that time. And yeah, you also have to think about, you know, transportation back then. They had to live there to work the fields and, and you know, they didn't have cars, et cetera. So that also changed. So right now, everybody just uh, prefers to live in a in a bigger city or a bigger town. And they can, you know, they're just way more mobile. Uh, but back then, that's why those places existed, just because, uh, you know, those families were actually living there. Yeah. Does anybody do it? Has there been a, a famous historical estancia that's been refurbished or no? It's all, uh, it's mostly abandoned. I, it's a putt. Well, yeah, there are some that are are kept intact. Usually the ones that are closer to civilization, basically, they uh, and they're turned into hotels. And uh, yeah, there's some really nice examples. 
But yeah, I think, it, yeah, the majority of the ones I find are just like way too uh, far out in, into nowhere. Are they even listed or like on no, a real no. estate listing? So you would have to go and get a lawyer to dig up the the paperwork on it and find whoever owns it. And Yeah, very, very likely. Uh, yeah, no, I find these uh, estancias, I find them on some Facebook groups that uh, uh, they just go to these small rural towns, et cetera, and they take pictures. And then that's how I, I basically find out about them. <laughs> nice, nice. So, yeah, it reminds me of a, a story of a travel, I think. A travel couple, like a famous couple that has a huge YouTube channel. And for whatever reason, they they decided, oh, we're going to stop traveling and we're going to buy a house or a property in Argentina and go off the grid. And they tried. And then after two months, they gave up because I, oh, wow. I think it's it's not that easy, apparently, to, to build an off the grid house in Argentina. No, no. Well, it kind of, yeah, it depends on where it is and how close you are to the biggest town. But like even in in bigger towns like um, in, up north in in Salta, for example, you have uh, Cafachate, which is in between Tucumán and Salta. But there, if you want to, you know, build, because I know because I own a, a plot of land there, and uh, I have a friend there. He has like a you know very nice uh, estancia that he uh, made there. But he had to travel like three hours every single time, and he forgot a screw. Look, for example, you know. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it was, yeah, it, and, and that's the kind of thing you're dealing with, you know, in those far off regions. It's just like very hard to to get all the materials you need. Yeah, I imagine too, if if you're not accustomed to doing business in in Latin America, the bureaucracy to refurbish a historic house. I don't know. You tell me, but is, is it is there a lot of red tape and paperwork, and it's a nightmare. Yeah, usually for a lot of these things, people just do it without even you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. If it's three hours to yeah. get a screw. It's three hours for the, the government agent to come and check out the property. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, there are definitely a lot of uh, laws and rules and red tape, et cetera. But, uh, you know, if it's, for example, even here in Buenos Aires, uh, there's a lot of uh, just homes that are called uh, Propia Horizontal, and which are just like uh, one level uh, homes which are all in the same alleyway, for example. And um, the thing is, like, that is considered as as one plot uh, in the city of one address. And basically, if you want to change anything in your house, so for example, where I live, I have like eight neighbors uh, in the same alleyway that uh, faces the street, basically. And they, they're all houses like next to each other uh, from that hallway. The thing is, if you want to do modifications, uh, you have to get the plans for every single house and everybody's done mod uh, modifications, so it's like impossible to get those. And you have to file those plans at the uh, municipality to get a permit to uh, to construct or, or alter anything that is, uh, you know, uh, increases your square uh, meters. So basically, what in practice happens is nobody does that, and everybody just starts building. Uh, you know, and everybody has extensions to their home, like a quincho or you know another terrace, etc. And uh, none of that is registered, which is also why if you buy property like that, you will always have part of the property that is outside of the contract. And you just like, you know, okay, this is also part of the property, but it's not in the contract. Here is the money, you know, off the table. Uh, it's it's mm. very similar in countries like Greece, et cetera. They also have that where so much is just built without it registering on the deed. You know, it's like it's not even registered. That's so interesting. So that, I guess the tax base is lower too, right? Because you're technically only paying taxes on a, a 50 square meter yeah. place when in reality you have 70 or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That and uh, and in general, like property taxes are very low uh, here. You only pay like a muni municipal tax and, uh, you know, I, ha I pay, I think, you know, a couple hundred bucks per year for, you know, a hundred plus a square meter home, which is, you know, nothing. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. interesting. That's a really interesting anecdote. So what else? Is there anything else before we, we finish up that we didn't cover that you think's worth worth talking about? No, I think we we kind of covered everything. Yeah, I think you know it's we'll have to see in the next couple of months what what happens if they can already restructure. I mean the the bigger maturities are all due in in 2025 and 2026, so there's still some time. But yeah, we'll have to see what, what happens with that and the exchange rate because, uh, 
you know, I think as as soon as the exchange rates really starts running off and he keeps the FX restrictions on, then, you know, we could have a potential problem down the road. Cool. cool. Well, we'll have to follow up then towards the end of the year and yeah. do another one and get an update. So where can people find you? You know, Twitter, LinkedIn, the blog, Substack. Uh, I'll yeah, link it so, all in the show notes. Uh, but... Okay. Yeah. So you can you can find me mainly on Twitter. Uh, that is uh, at Bowtie Mara. I also have my main blog, which is uh, bowtiemara.io. And if you want to uh, book a private consultation for, you know, uh, Argentina residency or, you know, real estate investments or whatever, uh, you can do that on bowtiemara.com. Uh, and, you know, you can just uh, book a time and, uh, and then we can have a chat. Great. Thanks so much for doing this. It was a pleasure. Yeah, likewise.